alms? Alms for the poor, sir? Would you help the less fortunate with your gifts? Bah! Who needs your generosity anyway? Good day, Gaston. How is my favourite urchin this fine day? Good day to you, Miss Fiona. Opening up shop, are we? Aye, that's what one does if one wants to do business. Indeed. Speaking of which, milady, you wouldn't happen to have a small bit of copper you could spare for a poor cripple? I suppose I could hire you to wipe down the windows for tuppence. Come along now. I'll do my best. It's not easy to wipe windows on crutches, miss. We'll make do. Let me go get a bucket of water. All right. Uh, hello, sir. How may I help you? I don't have time to waste with you at present. Is your employer here? Uh, my what? Your boss. Is your boss here? Did you say something, Destin? Oh, oh Mr. Artie, I wasn't expecting you. This much is obvious, Miss Fiona. I'm here to collect on your loan. But, sir, we talked about this. I haven't made enough sales this month to cover rent and what I owe you. Your personal business is your own affair, Miss Fiona. My concern is purely financial. I hear tell that the carts are not friendly to those who default on their debts. I will pay you back. I promise. I expect to make a good profit for the holidays. And there should be enough to pay you then. The holidays are months away, Miss Fiona. Do you expect me to wait that long while you get your pitiful business together? It's not pitiful. She runs a right good shop if I do say so myself. And what would a worthless scoundrel like yourself know about anything of real value? You have till the end of the day, Fiona. I will be passing by on my way home and you may pay me then. If not, I'm afraid I will have to get the law involved. That's not fair. Hush, Destin. Mr. Artie is quite generous to give me more time. You will have your money by the end of the day. See that you do. Ten after five, no later. Thank you, sir. What a lap he was. You're going to show him, aren't you, Miss Fiona? I suppose I'll have to. Are you going to stop with the windows or shall I find someone else who will? But what will you do? Well, when things seem to be impossible, I often turn to a friendly companion that cheers me up every time. Oh... You want me to start it up for you, then? Yes, please. Hi, Miss Fiona. What you doing? Hello, Destin. I was just reading and enjoying my garden. How are you today? I'm good. I was going to head over to Mr. Jacob's garage and see who's there. Oh, well, I happen to know that he isn't. I saw him drive by with Flynn just now. Looked like he was taking his boat out to the lake again. Oh, man. I guess I can go down to the Old Forest Bridge and see if Bailey or Laura are down there. Hey, Destin. What are you doing here? Hey, Artie. Just talking to Miss Fiona. Oh. You coming to Mr. Jacob's garage soon? I was going to, but then Miss Fiona told me that he isn't home. He's not? Doesn't he know that it's Saturday morning? Where are we supposed to hang out if there's nobody there? Well, I know it's a poor substitute, but my garden is pretty comfortable, and I was considering pouring myself a glass of orange juice. Would you care for some? Sure, I guess. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Wonderful. I won't be but a moment. So, what's that you've got there, Artie? Extra homework? This is what I wanted to talk to Mr. Jacobs about. It's a script for the school's Christmas play, The Christmas Carol. Christmas? But it's still summer. Yeah, but Christmas plays take a while to put together. In fact, this isn't the whole script. It's just a passage that they want us to use when we read for the audition. Oh, so you aren't in the show yet. You're just trying out for it. I mean, sure, if you want to get technical about it. But seeing as how I've been acting for years, I've got something that all directors want. You're tall? Professionalism. I know what I'm doing, and I'm good at it, too. I mean, not to toot my own horn or anything, but yeah, I'll get in. Okay. What part are you trying out for? I mean, there are a lot of great supporting characters in the show, but if I'm going to try out, there's obviously one part that I have to try out for. I don't know if it's been pointed out to you, but I'm a little kid. And when it comes to figuring out what older kids are talking about, you're going to have to do a little more explaining than usual. Oh, sorry. I know how that goes. I'm trying out for the main character, Ebenezer Scrooge, the black-hearted moneylender that learns the truth about Christmas. It's still weird. What is? Talking about Christmas this early, still not used to it. How about listening to the radio? Would that make it better? Sure. 
Oh wait, Mr. Jacobs has a radio here? I'm pretty sure that's what's on the table over there. Miss Fiona must be borrowing it for the weekend or something. Okay, well, sure, let's start it up. Well, I hope that you get the part, Artie. It's always fun to be a part of a play, and playing the main character is a big responsibility. Yeah, I know. Any tips on how to get the part, Miss Fiona? Hmm. It's been a while since I've tried out for a play. But I seem to remember in my acting classes there was a saying, An actor prepares. Okay, but what does that mean? Yeah, I don't get it either, Destin. That could mean pretty much anything, Miss Fiona. I suppose so. But it's a saying that is talking about getting into the mind of your character. Study them. Learn their hopes and dreams, their deepest fears and sorrows. Charles Dickens wrote a lot about Ebenezer Scrooge's past and personality, so learning all of these things shouldn't be hard at all. Huh. I thought he was just greedy. Well, that's a good place to start. What does it mean to be greedy? You're selfish? All right. What else? There's more? Uh, I guess it means that you take more than you need. Good. So we know that it's caring only about yourself and taking more than you need. But why do you think that Ebenezer Scrooge acts that way? Because he's the bad guy? <laughs> I think you're right, Destin. But very often, there's something in our minds that makes us do what we do. Well, yeah. All of us have a part of us that makes us do what is wrong. That's what the Bible says, anyway. That's true. Romans 8, Galatians 5, and other parts of the New Testament talk about this aspect of being human. These verses call it the flesh. Sounds kind of gross. <laughs> I can't say I disagree with that. The flesh is what tells people it's okay to do things that are wrong because it will feel good. Or at very least, make pain and sadness go away for a little. Yeah, my brother Zach was telling me about some of his friends from college that aren't doing well right now because that's what they do all the time. He says some of them have even been arrested for doing bad stuff at some pretty crazy parties. Like what? Mom wouldn't let him tell me, but I just know that they were doing what Miss Fiona's talking about. Trying to feel good and forget about their troubles. Hmm, yes. There are many ways that people can get in trouble looking for good feelings. But you know, this kind of thing can even happen with good things, too. Good things? What do you mean? Take food, for instance. I'm pretty sure that we can agree that food is one of God's greatest gifts to the world. But the flesh, this drive to do whatever it takes to feel good, tells us that if a little bit of food is good, then why stop there? Why not a little more? This can take a good thing, like enjoying a meal, and turn it into eating way too much. Okay, so back to Ebenezer Scrooge. Money isn't a bad thing, really, but he loved it so much that it became a bad thing. Exactly. Um, I'm still not understanding how a good thing can be a bad thing. Like, how good food can become bad for me? I mean, unless you leave it in the fridge too long. That is one way. But I think a drama script might help us out here. Don't tell me. Mr. Jacobs sent you a script this morning that just so happens to be about what we've been talking about. Nope. He just gave me access to his cloud storage. He's been uploading scripts so they aren't just stored away in some file cabinet where Noah can get to them. I'll just have to skim through and see what I can find. And I guess we'll listen to the radio. And now. From the garage of Lionel Jacobs comes the pretty good drama, The Little Engine That Couldn't Stop, an adapted biblical teaching about self-control. Far away in a land where steam trains ruled the rails, there lived a little engine and his driver, Austin Vales. That's right, I run this engine, and we are always on time. Sometimes we're delayed by weather, but that ain't no fault of mine. Driver's right, we're really fast, and anybody knows that when it comes to travel, we're the fastest travel goes. So you can imagine there was a local sense of pride of the speed at which you traveled on this pretty sweet train ride. Austin waved at the children, the engine's whistle blew, and everyone would come to watch the train rolling through. It was one night, the engine thought. It's great I am so fast. If anyone asked to race, I'm sure they'd come and last. I'd chuff and puff and heave and ho and leave them far behind. And at the end, I'd be dubbed king of engine kind. 
Hello there, friend. The driver called as he settled in his place. I heard you talking as I approached. What's this about a race? I was just thinking how fast I am and how I enjoy it so. You just pull the handle and toot toot, off I go. The driver cracked a smile and he stoked the fire bright. Well, tell you what, my engine, let's go as fast as light. They sped around the rail yard, collecting all their cars, aided by the moonlight and a million shining stars. All aboard! The engine cried, ready to begin. The passengers all took their seats as they piled in. Austin pulled the lever and the engine picked up speed. He stopped at 45%. That's all we really need. But the engine wouldn't have it. He loved the rush and said, Austin, give me power! I need to forge ahead! Austin chuckled at his friend and pushed the lever more. The engine lurched with added force as the percent was 64. Faster, faster! The engine cheered, his judgment getting hazy. And at his word, the driver went and did something quite crazy. I'll go 100! He yelled as he pushed the lever all the way. And what happened next was incredible. A legend to this day. One minute they were in New York, the next they'd see Niagara. Next was Brazil, then the Congo, Australia, and then Siberia. Egypt, Haiti, Belgium, Hong Kong, Argentina, and Wales. This ride was getting way too fast, even for Austin Vales. This is fun and all, my little friend, but shouldn't we slow up soon? I wanted to get there faster, not take a shortcut to the moon. I cannot stop! The engine wailed as they bolted through Ukraine. The passengers were terrified. Let us off this train! But to no avail did they cry, for stopping there was none in Portugal, Mongolia, Mexico, or Lebanon. But finally, after what seemed like days, the train did slow down. And when it stopped, all on board jumped off and kissed the ground. Everyone was okay, and for this they gave a shout. But the engine would never go again. His parts were all worn out. His brakes were completely melted, as were his wheels and frame. Even if they could fix him, he'd never be the same. The moral is that there are things that are not bad in life. Money, food, exercise, and the love of man and wife. All these things are good, but turn bad if we let them. If we lose all control and do anything to get them. Instead, chase after God, because only He can make you whole. Don't be a slave to earthly things. Instead, have self-control. Miss Fiona, I have some questions about what we've been talking about today. All right, Tustin. What can I clear up for you? We've been talking about greed, and that thing inside us that makes us do bad things, right? The flesh, mm -hmm. (sighs) mm-hmm. Yeah, that. So, what I want to know is, how can we not be greedy? Weren't you listening to the end of the story about the train? We need to use self-control. Okay, but some of us don't know what that means, Artie. Let me explain. We talked earlier about doing things that make us feel good, And though there's nothing wrong with feeling good, we need to make sure that we are in control, able to decide when we have had enough, and stop when we decide that. So basically, controlling yourself. Self-control. Right. Okay, but how do I do that? I've tried having self-control, and it's not easy. No, you're right about that. Self-control is something we need to practice to get good at. But it's also something that comes easier the more we let God into our lives, like it says in Galatians 5.23. So is self-control the only thing we can do to not be greedy? I can think of a couple more things that can help. For one, if we are thankful for what we already have, there's less of a chance that we will want any more. Paul in the Bible tells us in Philippians 4 that he discovered how to be happy and thankful for what he had, no matter if he had a lot or just a little. Greed can't get far if you are already happy with what you have, so thankfulness is a great way to fight it. Anything else we can do? One other thing that comes to mind is the one thing that Jesus tells us can fix any wrong on earth. Love. When we love other people and God, we don't think about how much we can get, we think about how much we can give others. Sounds like the opposite of greed to me. Yeah, so self-control, love, and thankfulness are how not to be greedy. It's a good start anyway. I'll remember that, and it's weird to say, but I'll do my best to not have any of those when I try out for the part of Scrooge. As long as it's only acting. Of course. I'd better head over to the school. The auditions should be starting any minute now. See you later. Good luck, Artie. I'd better go, too. Thanks for explaining stuff this morning, Miss Fiona. You're not that bad at it. Glad I'm at least adequate. (laughs) 
Have a good day, Dustin. Bye. Hmm. Not bad at it. Right. How does Lionel turn these things off? Oh, here we go. 